Hello? Hello, Ben. Just grab that. Hello? Still not connecting. We can have a telephone call if that works for you. Um, if you don't mind calling me because I don't have your direct number. Um, I'll give you my phone number if you can hear me. Um, my number is 917. Two two four seven six one seven. That's nine one seven two two four seven six one seven. Hi. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Hi. Hello. I can't hear you. Okay. Oh, um, there you are. <laughs> sorry, oh. I got called real quick. Um, okay, awesome. So let's see here. I can't remember. Did you send me a list of questions? Um, I sent you, I think, to the website that had the questions. Uh, there might have been questions on the, e the email as well. Um, I printed out the email that I normally send everybody. So I can just go directly okay. from there if you prefer. Or do you just want to touch, oh. like I can give you the categories, okay. and touch upon the categories, or I can just ask you questions. It's whatever you prefer. Um, I'm, I'm cool either way. You know what? I can't find them, but that's all right. We'll just. Okay, we'll work let's it. Let's just go for it. <laughs> so, well, it's a um, pleasure meeting you. What's your name? My name is Ben Sorrell. Sorrell, my name is Myra Perdomo. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, so I've been here at the museum for just over six years, I think. And can you just state the uh, name of the museum? Uh, the Navajo Nation Museum in Winter Rock, Arizona. And I am the associate registrar here. So I take care of a lot of these types of interviews, uh, do lectures, cultural lectures, cultural sensitivity training, uh, for like traveling nurses and traveling doctors, lawyers, you know, all those types of professionals that deal closely with uh, the native people here, the Navajo specifically. Um, and I do tours and these lectures can range from fifth graders all the way up to, like I said, you know, uh, professionals. So on top of that, I also deal with our collections. I take care of donations. Um, so I, I feel I'm rather comfortable with these types of interviews. And of course, you know, through COVID and all that, these were going on almost once every day, if not two or three times a day. So um, yeah, let's go ahead and jump into it. And I will try to be as candid as possible. And, um, you know, sometimes <laughs> there are things that I don't know, and, and I'll just be straight out and say, I, you know, I don't know. And I'll try to give you a couple of sources that you might, you know, chase down. Perfect. 
Um, okay, well, great. I'm doing a documentary. It's called the Indigenous Documentary. And okay. currently I'm going to 13 countries, including America, visiting indigenous cultures, um, asking them a few simple questions so that we can basically all be on the same page, you know, because I feel like indigenous cultures have the truth and we haven't been mm -hmm. told the truth in, overall. Um, yes, and yes. I'm a natural healer. So I, I wanted to learn directly from the people, not from someone who learned from someone who learned from someone who learned from someone. Sure, um, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we always start off with just the healing question and then it kind of goes wherever the conversation takes us. Um, I know yeah. healing is a very sensitive topic to a lot of cultures. So it's just like whatever you feel comfortable sharing about how um, your culture uses uh, or how your culture heals both the physical body and the mental body because, or the mental aspect because not many people talk about the mental aspect. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Traditionally, healing would take place um, in a hogan, which is one of our traditional homes. And the philosophy behind that is these traditional homes, these hogans, are a place of power. And they, they were used for so many things. They, they weren't just a living structure. It was kind of like our church. It was our schoolhouse. Um, of course, you know, the family gathered and lived there. Um, kids were raised and nurtured. And of course, you know, it protected us obviously from the environments, the cold and the rain. Um, so it's, it's a very multi-purpose uh, structure. And there's quite a few still being used on the uh, Navajo Nation to this day for those very reasons. And the re one of the biggest reasons why these ceremonies have to be held within a Hogan is because of the innate power that is uh, built into the Hogan itself. Um, there are particular ways to build these Hogans and these structures. That way um, they can be used as, as a ceremonial center and a center for healing as well. And we go through songs. Um, most of our healing ceremonies go for four nights all the way up to the longest one being 20 nights. Um, so some of them, you know, they do tend to be marathons. <laughs> uh, for both the patient as well as the healer. Um, we call them Hatafis, H-T-A-L-I, Hatafi. And essentially it's, it's, a, it's a speaker of healing. Um, and that's more or less what, what they do for a living. Um, so kind of like a, a priest has his calling to be a man of the cloth or, you know, nuns, they have callings and, you know, same thing is true for Navajo healers. When they're young, and sometimes it's not even when they're young, sometimes it's not until, you know, they are 40, 50 years old. And then they start looking for an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. And through this apprenticeship, they help with uh, different ceremonies for healings. And as they go through this process, they learn the songs, the stories that are necessary for every ceremony that, you know, might be needed by the community or a particular patient. And this mentorship goes on for years and years and years and years. It's not just something that you kind of jump into and then, okay, I'll be done in four years and I'll get my degree kind of like college. Um, it's, it's an ongoing learning process. And depending on who you speak with and who their mentor was, certain ceremonies may not be done exactly the same, but their intent is still uh, there. And we used to have over 200 different ceremonies that were practiced. And this was going back to um, pre-Columbian contact, pre-Spanish contact. Uh, but now those roughly have dwindled to about 60 or 70. And a lot of that has to do with some medicine people don't want to pass on these ceremonies. Um, and then, of course, you know, coming with the modern days, time has become a real big commodity. And so some of these 16, 20 night ceremonies, they're abridged and shortened down to fit inside of a weekend. Yes, the intent is still the same, but there are people out there who argue the fact that these need to take that amount of time, that extended amount of time, because this is what the holy people pass down to us. And so we need to continue to observe that and do it correctly. 
Um, and, you know, of course, with any type of ceremony and, and traditional healing, there are taboos that come along with it. Uh, and so some of those is if you don't do it correctly or in the right order, you could end up harming your patient in some way, shape or form. Some of it could be physical harm. Others could be spiritual harm. They could uh, have, you know, a mental breakdown, uh, panic attacks, you know, things like that. So it's very important that these ceremonies that are conducted are conducted per proper teaching. And it's not just something that, you know, your average Joe Schmo can go out and do. Um, though there are people like that, unfortunately, that kind of capitalize on people's pain uh, and strife. So, you know, that, that's something we do have to look out for as well. Now, <clears throat> as we've come into the modern era, uh, and, and like use that just because of the lack of a better term, it's not like we were savages back in the day or whatsoever, but with the incorporation of modern medicine, we've developed a, uh, a type of synergy with modern medicine and then our traditional ways of healing. And one of the local hospitals here, it's, it's one of the largest on the Navajo Nation. Um, they actually have practitioners on staff to help their patients heal spiritually and mentally, as well as, you know, they're seeing the modern day doctor and getting the uh, advantages of modern medicine, essentially. So it's kind of a holistic healing um, that takes place at some of our hospitals and it's encouraged, but it's not mandatory. And, you know, the, of course, the older generation, our elders, they tend to um, take more stock in the traditional ways of healing. But at some point, there's no getting away from modern medicine to heal them as well. Um, but for us, it seems to be more well-rounded. Um, same thing with, you know, let's say like substance abuse or domestic violence, where you would have, you, would, you might go to a therapist or something. Um, that is also worked in conjunction with uh, the spiritual healing, the traditional ways of healing each other. And, and we're not talking like, you know, your standard group counseling or anything. Um, some of these ceremonies are were meant and developed to treat mental illnesses. Uh, the one great example that I use, and unfortunately it's become more prevalent because of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan for the past two decades is PTSD. And the ceremony that we used is called the night way or the enemy way, I'm sorry. And this is a four night um, ceremony and it kind of includes the family, the extended family, and the community to some extent, because bringing those people together is said to um, bring their own powers of healing as well. You know, the, the healing of family and friends and the community there to support the patient who is going through these troubled times mentally and, and dealing with PTSD, the horrors of war and combat. Um, and then, of course, the, the negativity that comes being with being around death constantly. Uh, and so that's part of the ways that we use traditional healing in contemporary times for today's uh, ills and woes that, that you know, exist not, on, not only on the Navajo Nation, but in any community that you go to, any society. Um, and, and our doctors that come here, um, as I mentioned, I do cultural consulting and, and, and uh, cultural sensitivity training for people like doctors and nurses so that they understand why we've chosen to um, use both our traditional healing and modern medicine and bringing them together to help each other and to better the patient. And it's because it's not something that is truly understood by Western medicine. Uh, so, you know, it's some of the doctors are, are get a kind of a culture shock of the way we do things down here. Um, but fortunately, you know, we do provide services such as, such as uh, cultural sensitivity training to let these people know what to expect, um, how to deal with elders and their way of thinking, their way of um, practicing the traditional ways that they were taught when they were younger and how to work together 
for the benefit of a, not just the patient, but for the community as a whole. So it seems like a lot of these ceremonies, they, they last a long time. They're to heal the body and the, the mind. But um, what do you, to me, it sounds like energy. It sounds like the energy of the entire family and the love and all of that is part of the healing. Um, yes. When you bring the family together, especially for PTSD. I, I know I, I just dated a man that had PTSD. It's not very easy to deal with. Um, but you do need a community to help them. But, and I feel like now in the culture that we're living, we don't have that communal kind of mm -hmm. togetherness that you, you still carry with you. Um, do you think that part of the healing, the reason it takes so long is, is it, um, cause I've been talking to a lot of different people obviously, and they say that there is good and evil um, and that there's this constant war between good and evil. And that when people get sick, it's because they feed the evil. What is, what is your culture's view on that? And like, how do you protect yourself from evil? So our overall view, uh, and, and it's, it's kind of a pillar of, of our beliefs is a concept of hojon. And this is a Navajo word. Weird thing about Navajo language is there's no one-to-one -one comparison. It's a very conceptual language. Our words tend to describe rather than have a straightforward meaning. Um, so hajo is this concept and idea of harmony, harmony within yourself, both physically, mentally, spiritually, and then having harmony with your family, your community, and you know the, the universe as a whole. Uh, that harmony is, is based on balance. So we don't really see that there's a fight between good and evil. Um, it's more of maintaining a balance because you have to have both. You know, can't have light without dark. You can't enjoy happiness and joy without anger and sorrow. Um, so they go hand in hand. But it's, uh, it's our goal to maintain a balance between those two things. Um, yes, if you tend to be not a good person, you're kind of giving in to the darker energies. Um, but also, and of course, you know, that could hurt you, that could hurt your relationships. It, it can do a lot of bad things that we see on a daily basis. But on the opposite side, if you go a little bit too much towards the good forces, um, you can be taken advantage of, you know, people will use you. Um, you know, again, if you go too far to the other side, it, it'll hurt you, your family, or your relationships as well. Um, yes, there is a thing for us in our culture that you can be too nice, you can be too giving, and you know that will hurt you in ways that you might not even think of. Uh, so it's maintaining that balance, and that's more or less how we tend to protect ourselves, both physically, spiritually, mentally, is acknowledging that we as humans are fallible. Um, we will do not so great things. We may treat people not so well, um, but we can't do it all the time. We need to be able to maintain ourselves. Um, but also, you know, we can't give too much of ourselves away to other people because then we start to neglect ourselves. Um, so it's it's just that, that ideology of balance and you know you're supposed to walk in beauty so the things that you do you have to be mindful of the words that you say you have to be be very mindful of um you know you shouldn't wish harm upon anybody you know just basic humanistic elements of, of being a decent person um you know work hard but don't work too much Again, you might wear yourself out and after that, you're not good to anybody, um, but don't be lazy. You know, don't sit around and eat chips all day because um, that, again, it'll affect your health. So it's, it's just this whole idea of balance and this balance is ingrained through everything. Um, and it's very indicative of, of tribal thought and the fact that things are cyclical. You know, it's, it's not, especially time, it's not a linear concept for us and, and with a lot of tribal societies. Instead, it's cyclical. 
So if you do good for people, you, it may not come right around, but it, you know, somewhere down the line, when you need help, someone will be there to help you out. Um, same thing if, you know, you, you leave a grandma sitting at a bus stop in the middle of, you know, a downpour, and you just, you get in your truck and you drive off without helping, offering any help, that too could come back. And, you know, if you need help, somebody might not be there. Um, so, you know, keeping yourself in check, helping out where you can, doing what you can, um, but also not allowing yourself to become uh, stale, you know, uh, stale and stagnant, because that's not good as well. Um, and we don't really have totems per se. You know, in some uh, Eastern cultures, or I should say non-Western cultures, you know, people have talismans, they use crystals. Um, there are points in some ceremonies that, you know, totems and, uh, you know, these, these talisman and trinkets and what have you, um, these tokens of protection are used, but not on a daily basis. Um, and there are certain times where it is encouraged, say, for instance, um, so we have the four sacred mountains and within this landmass of the four sacred mountains uh, that was bestowed upon us by our creator within those mountains we are protected culturally um, but it's when we go outside of those four sacred mountains that we um, are liable to expose ourselves to unnecessary evils and unnecessary harm um, or you know mentally you might be affected, get, let's just say homesick, okay? And you start snapping at people, you're not doing a good job. Um, your boss is always on your case for one reason or another. Uh, so what I was taught, taught when, you know, I go and do lectures outside of the Navajo nation is to always have turquoise on me. And you'll see Navajos wearing turquoise all the time. And turquoise is supposed to help protect you from those unnecessary woes, but also as a speaker, um, it's believed that it's to help you speak clearly, help you get your point across, and to help you avoid saying things that are untrue, that are hurtful, um, that don't better your audience or yourself. Um, so, you know, the, like I said, there's small cases and instances like that that some people do follow. Um, and it, of course, depends on person to person. It's not a big widespread, like standardized, when you do this, you have to do this kind of thing. Um, and that's, that's also part of the reason that some of our traditional ways are going by the wayside is because the younger generations, they're so ingrained with, you know, the society and the cultural norms of the United States and, and the Western world. Um, that they tend to just cast off that stuff and, you know, oh, that's, that's um, voodoo mumbo jumbo nonsense that, you know, my, my grandparents, they didn't know any better, but, you know, I know better now and because I went to college or, you know, whatever, whatever mentality and way of thinking that they, they bring upon themselves, they kind of stay away from it. Um, but yeah, there's no like clear cut ways of protecting ourselves, but rather than just being mindful of how you conduct yourself on a day to day basis. Okay. Because, um, I mean, when you say that these ceremonies are 14, this is the last question I'm going to ask about healing, and then we'll move on to another category. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, when you say that these ceremonies last 10 to 14 days, um, I interviewed someone previously, and he said that, you know, they use a lot of like herbs and and different things. Um, I did. I participated in a um, sweat lodge ceremony, and okay. that was amazing. Um, but he used a lot of pressure point techniques, and I find that he explained that it had to do with the dream catcher, showing you where the pressure points on the body are to help you heal. Is that something that you participate in as well? Um, not. Not in a specific manner is that. Um, we do have something similar. Um, and yes, we do use a lot of herbs that uh, need to be gathered from certain areas, certain mountains, valleys, meadows. Um, same thing with water. When water has to be used in a ceremony, um, there's 
particular springs that are associated with uh, the different songs and ceremonies that are being practiced. So, you know, the healer or the patient or both together have to go to these areas and collect the necessities before they can start. And one of the big things is um, kind of like the dream catcher, but not really is our sand paintings. Oh yeah, I saw them. So, you know, our sand paintings, today they become, you know, curio gift shop type stuff, but where their origins lie is in healing ceremonies. And the sand paintings are used in the longer ceremonies, you know, like the 10, 14, 20 day ceremonies. And what ends up happening is the medicine man and his apprentice will create sand paintings and each color, each symbol, each deity um, created and used has a particular job. And as they're doing, creating these sand paintings, they're singing, the patient is singing, and the patient is seated in, right in the center of the sand painting as it's created. Now, one of the things about, you know, not just ceremonies um, specifically, but also through artwork and creativity is our culture places a lot of value on the process and not so much the product. Yes, the product is nice and you can do all kinds of different things with a finished product, but it's the process that you go through that um, is the rewarding outcome. So these you know, long ceremonies, these sand paintings, it's through the process of performing those ceremonies and those healing acts that the patient um, is able to get into a mindset and almost fall into like a meditative trance um, without really knowing it. And so, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the ceremony, the sand paintings will be completely destroyed and, you know, taken apart. Uh, there's a few procedures that the patient has to follow, like no touching people, um, you can't eat during, while the sun is up. You can't bathe for four days after or however long the medicine, the, the practitioner um, informs you. It's and it's through those processes. Again, that that is the healing factor. Um, and we do have sweat lodges. But you know, again, that's mainly for men. And it's to help them purify themselves, but also to um, have time to meditate more or less. I mean, I, I don't like using the word meditate and meditation, but you know, for this instance, it's just, it's one of the best terms I can use to uh, relate the, what we, what we do in our ceremonies and how we go through things. Uh, and, you know, we don't really do much with like uh, pressure points or acupuncture, uh, massaging, nothing really big like that. Um, it's, it's really mainly through physical acts like sand painting or, you know, singing. Singing is a huge part of it. Um, part of the songs, you know, you're, you're kind of summoning the help of the deities. Uh, but again, you know, I mean, you can turn to Tibetan monks and, you know, this repetition of singing or voicing um, can put you into a, a trance state as well, or into a, a deeper state of awareness, um, for instance. So, but herbs and herbs, oh, and the, the sand, for these sand paintings, those also have to be collected from certain areas to be useful. Um, and then the dyes to dye the sand also needs to come from certain plants from certain areas. Um, as well as certain times of the year. So it's, it's, it's pretty involved. Um, it's not just the ceremony itself. You, you have to go and collect and leading up to the beginning of the ceremony and then there's processes that you have to follow after the ceremony. Um, so it, it is pretty involved and it's a hands-on experience. And some of the people that I've spoken to, um, which includes some professional Navajo psychiatrists and psychologists, they've seen that being an active participant in your own healing 
in and of itself is, is productive, extremely productive. You don't feel as though um, you're out of control or you have no control over your Ill illness. You know? In some cases like cancer, um, I know a lot of cancer patients, they, I've had quite a few in my family where they feel totally helpless that this, this monster is eating them from the inside and they can't do anything. Uh, so, you know, put, having ceremonies for them like this puts them in the driver's seat for, you know, just to use that term lightly, puts them in the driver's seat of their own well being and their own future. Uh, you know, and, and I don't know somebody who likes to be out of control over their own life. You know, I don't think a person out there exists like that. Uh, so it's, 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 it's extremely productive, um, again, not just for the physical well-being, but for the mental well-being. Yeah. You know, we are a firm believer that in order to heal the body, you also have to heal the mind and the spirit. Um, you, know, you can't get away from those three. If you heal only one of them, you know, a sickness might come back because you didn't pay enough attention to the spiritual side of healing or the mental side of healing. So we, as a Navajo culture, tend to focus on those three instead of you know, modern medicine, which is really just focused on uh, pharmaceuticals and the physical well-being of, of a patient. Um, and if they want to be mentally treated, you know, they have to go to a specialist, like a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a counselor, what have you. Uh, for us, it's, it's all one thing. Okay. And then um, another question that I, I just um, looked at the sheet is, I don't know if you could answer this because I know a lot of the women that I spoke to when I pulled over on the side of the road to buy the jewelry. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all over. I was in, um, I went to Antelope Canyon and I, I bought a bunch of stuff up there and then I drove from Sedona all the way up there and back. So I, I met a lot of people, but nobody would let me film them. <laughs> and I'm okay with that because I completely understand but it's uh, the topic of miscarriage because I know that all over the world this happens. Nobody talks about mm -hmm. it and nobody talks about the healing and the aftercare. Is there a way that you in your culture or should I speak with someone else about that? How you would heal someone? So like I can only touch very lightly on it. It's not something I'm super familiar with. And what I know is really just one thing. And um, so, Technically, when you're pregnant, you're not supposed to leave the home. You're not supposed to host visitors at your home. You basically just have to stay at home with your family or your husband or, or you know, whoever lives in your household for 40 days. And then after that 40 days, you can go and you know, start doing some light preparing. Um, but even that, there, there are beliefs against pre uh, preparation and after you have your child uh it's another 40 days that you can't do anything it's just supposed to be with your child now on the side of preparing is because we know we've always known that miscarriage and stillborn and, and you know complications with pregnancy has existed um we've created beliefs around that to potentially help prevent it. And one of those is you're not supposed to name your child before it is born. You're not supposed to buy baby clothes. You're not supposed to buy baby food, you know, cribs. You're not supposed to like remodel a whole room for the baby before they are born. Um, it's not a sense of like bad luck, but it's a sense of you are being too prideful in preparing and anticipating the will of the creator and the, the deities uh, that we recognize. And we don't want to be so presumptuous and question, you know, what, what is in store for us by preparing for a child that, you know, could be taken. And so all that preparation is not done until after the child is born. And then I think you're supposed to wait four days before you even uh, try to name it. 
So you can't go through baby names, baby books and all that stuff, you know, that that's indicative of, of, a, of motherhood. You know, I know some people are like super excited for a baby shower. So all of that comes afterwards. Uh, and it's to help protect the mother as well as the child. But also if you look at it from a mental health uh, standpoint, she's already going through a lot of pain. You know, if, if a mother or would be mother miscarries. And so they don't need the extra reminder of, you know, oh, well, we were gonna name her this and what are we gonna do with all these baby clothes? And, you know, we had the car seat and we, we did a whole bedroom and now it's just a sour, sour, sad reminder of a child that will never be. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's kind of a, a buffer, a mental buffer, mental health buffer. But, you know, that's really all I can go into on that. Um, I don't have extensive knowledge in you know, those types of things. And there is some segregation between knowledge, uh, between male and female. Like there are some things that I can't speak about with a, a female, um, Navajo or non-Navajo and vice versa. There are things that females cannot speak with a, a male about either. Um, and that includes their husband. So there are, you know, there is some segregation and uh, childbirth and, you know, complications that kind of falls into that realm. Yeah, if, um, if at the end of the interview, if there's anyone you can recommend that I could speak with about that, I would really okay. appreciate that. Um, okay. The next topic would be music. I know you mentioned that there's a lot of like chanting and music in the ceremonies, but do you also use music for leisure or is it just for healing? Um, I know a lot of people say that we're vibrational beings. So it's all about being on the right frequency for yourself. So I, yeah. I don't know if you do it the same way. Or... So Navajo people in general are quiet. Uh, we don't like to, a lot of us don't like to stand out. We're, you know, we tend not to be very boisterous. You know, and then, you know, in today's society, that's, that's kind of a handicap, but it's just the way that we're, we're raised. Um, so traditional singing, singing songs, you know, back in the day was not really a big thing. Um, and if you were singing these traditional songs, you could be, you know, summoning a deity when you really shouldn't be, you know, because you're not in a ceremony. You know, or it's not a proper time to be calling people. And for the most part, it wasn't recreational. Um, and, you know, if you look at it through anthropological lens, you don't want a, a whole community singing um, because, you know, it could bring unwanted attention from opposing tribes. So, you know, it was, it was a sense of survival. It was a tactic of survival, uh, you know, way back in the day, you know, a thousand years ago or so. Um, but of course, you know, today we do use music recreationally, um, but it's not our music. Uh, I don't know, have you ever been to like a, a powwow? I've never been to, a I wanted to do all of that, but there was nothing going on when I was there. <laughs> yeah, so powwow songs are mainly from Oh no, hello? You broke up. Hello? Hello? Oh, I don't know. Try. Hello? Hello? Oh, that's so interesting. At that, that specific point that it stopped. I don't know if you can see me. I, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Hello? Oh, we broke up. Oh, man. It's always, every time I do these interviews, there's always one part where it cuts off. With the last interview, it was when we were talking about the fourth dimension. But this one, it's about the powwow. It's almost like the universe doesn't want us to know this answer. So interesting. Hello? 
Hello? Okay, I'm sorry. I think some IT guys are messing with our internet. Um, <laughs> oh. like, as soon as you said in the powwow and then it just stopped and I was like, is that divine intervention? <laughs> so um, yeah, those the powwow songs are Plains Indians in origin, you know, the Sioux, the Crow, um, Shawnee, Pawnee, Arapaho. And those are what we do here. And the, the music that we use for, you know, dancing, recreation, things like that. Um, flute music, that kind of came around. Uh oh, what is this? Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Oh, there you okay. go. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're back. All right. So, um, where was I? Oh, flute music came around when tourism of the Southwest really became a big thing. Hmm. Um, so it's kind of a touristy thing for us. Uh, and, you know, there, there are flute makers, but the flute was traditionally used in ceremony and, and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, you know, th there are some Navajo composers out there that borrow from here and here. And, you know, it basically turns into a powwow music. But the one instance where we do use recreation and it's, it's traditionally been used is during shoe game, which happens during the winter. And shoe game can go on however long you want it to, because the way the rules are rigged up, it's, it's a gambling game, but you get each team gets, let's see, I forget how many each team gets. My math is terrible right now, 51 counters. So all together, there's 102 counters. And it's a gambling game. You got to guess which shoe the yucca ball is in. And it's kind of like a hide and seek with, a, with shoes and the yucca ball. And the two teams are opposing each other. And you know we have these shoe game tournaments here during New Year's Eve. And we start at 6, and we end it at midnight. But you know if you let it go, it could go for days. And that's, that's where it's originated from, is it went for four days. It was between night animals and day animals. And they were trying to decide if it should be night all the time or if it should be daylight all the time. And that's where you get the 102 counters and each team gets you know the 51. Because in the end, no one really wins. And that's how we have split days, uh, day and night, I should say. And so these songs actually, uh, relate back to the origins and how we came about the you know day and night having equal share around the clock and those songs that's that's really the only instance that I can trace back to our traditional life ways and traditional way of doing things where uh, songs were used as recreation but again if you're not playing the shoe game don't sing them <laughs> uh, and you know it's it's it, it's for all age groups and of course, I think one of the audio fashions that, that we use, you know, audio is through storytelling. So rather than singing, which all of our songs are, they're all a story of how things came to be. And that includes uh, the ceremonial healing songs. Those are all stories as well. Um, but, you know, they're just sung in a fashion. Um, so a lot of what we have and what, how we occupied ourselves revolved around um, oral tradition of storytelling. And again, you know, there's certain times of the year when you can tell those stories and certain times when you can't. And a lot of these things happen during the winter time because the animals in all these stories, you don't want to bring them to you. You don't want to disturb them while they're awake, which would be summer and spring. So we tell them when they're hibernating or you know they're hanging out in their own little den or cave or whatnot, and they're asleep essentially. And so they can't hear you talking about them. So that's when these stories and songs are usually told. And um, the, you were talking about these stories are told to remind you about creation. Um, that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons that I started the documentary is I was trying to find the truth about the history of the world. And I, I just don't yeah. believe the truth. But I think that the truth is in all of these indigenous stories all over the world. So what is your version of the truth from creation until now? And you could be as honest as you want, brutally honest, or as discreet as you'd like to be. It's actually, <clears throat> because I know so, people, 
it's always a it's always kind of a sticky thing for me um because i went to school for anthropology and so like i have the academic origins of you know our tribe and this and that um but also growing up navajo and working around traditional people who know all these stories they uh, I've, I've learned that side too the traditional origin stories creation stories or creation narratives i hate using the word stories it just it sounds like you're reading a dr seuss book um, but our narratives essentially we came up through four different worlds we are living in a fifth um, the glittering world and it's our stories can relate, and it's always the easiest way for me to do it when I have non-Navajos or speaking to non-Navajos about this is, um, so the first world was black and everything, a lot of things are color coded with black, white, yellow, and blue. Those are our four sacred colors. And there's, there's a lot of connections to everyday life and how we conduct ourselves that relate to the number four, the number two, eight, and then, um, the four mountains, the four sacred colors, the four times of day, four times of life, uh, all these, all these different things. And so the first world was the color black, the black world. And like I said, when I relate these stories or these concepts to non-Navajos, most of them being Christian or uh, being part of an Abrahamic religion like Judaism, um, in the beginning, there was only dark. Right, Genesis. And as we went through, it was just the holy people that were creating. You had talking God, you had black God. So the, the very, very essence of our holy people, our holy deities came from the black world here. And then you progressed up into the white world where you start seeing um, a few more deities uh, with more humanistic traits like uh, white shell woman, um, white pollen girl, blue pollen boy, uh, you know, so on and so forth. And as that progressed, um, we started to see some of the more. Um, oh, you broke up again. Hello? Hello? Oh, it's happening all over. Types of organism. Oh, okay. You broke up at Blue Pollen Boy. Okay, so that so after that you have the yellow world, or I'm sorry, the blue world. Um, let's see, let's just make sure my internet's okay. All right. Okay, and so you see that some of the more complex animals, coyote, bear. And they ha have these uh, anthropomorphic traits. So, you know, they can talk, they have reason, they have their own personalities. And this is where some of the creation comes in, like uh, how the stars are placed, how we got fire, um, all these, these different, uh, I don't wanna call them natural phenomenon, but things that exist in our world and how they came to be. And the animals had a lot to do with that. So animals became deities as well. And then we went into the yellow world where we started seeing humans. And humans taking on intelligence. The holy people started to give us our ceremonies, our songs, our stories, uh, where we begin to speak, where we were able to um, rationalize and reason, have logic, all this good stuff. And of course, you know, personalities, our good traits, our bad traits. And then after that, we get into the glittering world where we basically sit today. Now, uh, through these four worlds, each one was flooded by the holy people. And <clears throat> usually what was going on is, you know, the animals were misbehaving or as you get further into the uh, yellow world, the humans were misbehaving. They weren't following um, the teachings of the holy people as they should have been. And so these worlds continue to flood. And that's where we are today. And there are some things, some stories, depending on who, what elder you talk to, where there's going to be another flood for us as well, another rebirth, re regeneration. Um, and, you know, I mean, you go around the world and 
most of your cultures, whether they're tribal or, you know, what have you, more advanced, they're going to have a story of some type of flood or great deluge. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, in a nutshell, that's kind of where our uh, creation narrative lies. Uh, but it's, it's so complex that you basically need a lifetime to learn about these things. And within those creation narratives, those particular stories, um, you have lessons that are taught, but also a way to heal people, um, things to avoid, things you can and can't do, uh, you know, basically stories of how to, how to be Navajo and how to be a human and, and prosper and progress through your life and just genuinely be a good person. Um, so for me, again, talking to non-natives or non-Navajos, I always compare it to like Aesop's fables. You know, you have a story on top and then underneath you have some type of lesson. And then within that, you have a little bit more meaning. And, you know, it's a three or four tiered um, concept within one, one of his stories. And that's what basically our creation narratives look like as well. And children are start, we used to be taught these um, as they were growing up. And, you know, most of them can only be told during winter. And it, it kind of gave entertainment in a form that children wouldn't recognize it. So, you know, at our latitude, it's during the winter, it's usually dark about 16 to 18 hours a day. Um, sometimes, sometimes it's, it's, it's shorter, uh, but you know, our darkest days or longest day, longest nights are obviously during winter. So it's cold, it's snowing and you want to stay inside your hogan and kids are going to get rambunctious and they're going to get you know restless and so they all would gather around in the hogan and grandma or grandpa or mom and dad would tell these stories to the kids every winter and throughout the winter not only to entertain them and keep them to sit still but also to teach them our, our traditional ways of uh, life ways of doing things and, and what we see as proper i did not know it snowed in arizona <laughs> Oh yeah. Well, we sit at like 7,000 feet. Oh, okay. So yeah, we, we can get pretty decent snowstorms. Okay. Yeah. Cause I've heard about this flood happening again and that there's eight safe zones in America. One of them happens to be Arizona. Um, yeah. So it's just, it's interesting that you say that there should, there might be another flood again. Cause I've heard this many, many times. Um, so the next question would be about climate change, <laughs> since we're talking about weather. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the people I've spoken with have told me that what's going on with the climate has been predicted. And I was wondering, is climate change affecting you? And do you also have a prediction of it? So as far as our traditional beliefs and old ways of thinking and, and relating to the environment around us, it really depends on who you speak with as far as climate change. Um, I mean, it, it really is a moving target. And some of these things I'm, I'm telling you about, you know, they're, they're a little bit different depending on what area or what region of the Navajo Nation you're in. But climate change, both on a modern, like today's way of thinking and then our traditional ways of thinking, you can ask five different people and get five different opinions. Mm -hmm. Whether they're, it's been foretold or you know, whether it's just a part of the cycle. It, it really depends. And so I don't, I, I try not to give anything concrete because it's such a moving target and I don't wanna steer people into the wrong direction or guide them down a path that isn't indicative of our culture as a whole. So that one, I kind of just hands off and kind of let them do the, you know, your own personal research. And of course, as somebody's doing research, they're going to have their own take on it as well. Um, but as far as like small climate changes, or I mean, I shouldn't say climate changes, but small changes in the weather, seasonal changes in the weather. Um, some people, you know, they'll uh, associate it with different ways of doing things or you know maybe you were doing something that you weren't supposed to do uh, 
and you know the, i don't want to say they're like old wives tales but that's the best way to relate them um like so one of them when i was growing up is um <clears throat> you don't you don't step on stink bugs because it's going to bring a huge rain what's called a male rain and that's the hard heavy downpour that can be damaging to crops um, another one is, you know, you don't pick on lizards or frogs or horned toads um, because those are related to the rain, the rain people, the rain deities. And so you don't molest them because if you do, you might fall into a drought or, you know, your neighbor may have a nice crop because they got rain, but the rain's going to pass you over every time. So little things like that. Um, one of them is... You know, we have fry bread and some of these are more contemporary, but people take them as gospel. And, and this is a one example of that is so we have fry bread, you know, it's, it's, it's a favorite around here. And what a lot of the kids will do is they'll take powdered sugar and they'll put it on their fry bread. Well, when I was growing up, it was always, you know, you don't use powdered sugar if you put it on the fry bread. If you do, uh, it's going to snow really, really, really hard to the point where it, it gets dangerous. Uh, you know, so it's even the way we associate weather with the things that we do on a day to day basis changes with the time, with the generations. Um, and I'm a, I don't like what a lot of people do when I say, you know, these new things come up and it's taken as gospel. I call it contemporary traditionalism. And essentially it's, they pick something that they don't like or something that somebody's heard and you know, they run with it and they blow it out of proportion. Uh, for instance, like snakes. So people hate snakes. Yeah. And usually you're not supposed to be around them. You're not supposed to mess with them. But, you know, if you look back into our creation narrative, snakes were a huge help and they are a holy deity to us. Um, so, you know, that's that contemporary traditionalism where people take what they like to hear and then, you know, spread it like gospel. Like it's, it's the infallible word of the holy deities when, when it's not true and it tends to lead people down roads that um, should not be taken. Uh, and one instance, of, I'm going to relate back to the snake again, and it's thought and it's, it's, it's relationship to contemporary Navajos is our zoo, there were a couple of teachers that were bringing their kids and, you know, they have a riparian, so they have some skinks and they used to have snakes and lizards and toads, and, you know, all types of amphibians and reptiles. Well, these teachers actually lobbied for those snakes to all be removed because of this um, crooked way of thinking through contemporary traditionalism. What they were told is, you know, you're not supposed to be around these things when in fact, it's, it's okay. If you really want to dig into um, the history of it, you know. So now they're, they petitioned for those snakes to be taken out, which they were, and what they don't see is the unintended consequences. And in this case, it's hindering your children's education of animals, wild animals that they encounter, you know, that they might encounter when they walk outside their front door or when they're playing in the yard or whatever. Um, so it's, it's hindering and it's hurting their education. So that's what I try to stay away from when it comes to climate change and what some people might take as an overgeneralization of what Navajo people think. Um, on a contemporary note, we are trying to take our necessary steps to prepare for the future um, because, you know, we're in this huge, huge drought. It's, it's like a 20 year drought. Wow. And I'm sure you heard all over the news, you know, Lake Powell, Lake Mead, like having less than half of its capacity like from 10 years ago or something, this, this just damaging drought. So we're taking our necessary steps to protect our people and, and our resources as much as possible. Yes, because when I went to Antelope Canyon, they were telling me that you guys get about three inches of rain per year. And that's um, not enough. It might be in that area. Um, and, and you have to realize that the Navajo Nation is a little bit bigger than West Virginia. 
and we have, I think, four different climate zones. Mm -hmm. um, so it just depends on where you're at. Like where my house is, um, just in the past, this past weekend, we got four inches of rain. Um, and two weeks before that, when I was on vacation, we had gotten something like six inches of rain. So it just depends on where you're at on, on the Navajo Nation. And of course, like Lake Powell, it's, it's pretty, it's a high desert. They're not gonna get any rain to be, much rain to begin with. Interesting. Um, and then when it comes to things like that, like uh, external interference, have corporations or the local government affected your way or your tribes um, or people's way of life in any way? Absolutely. Um, I mean, the Colorado and Little Colorado River, you know, right now I am helping a law firm who had just started litigation in water rights for the Little Colorado River as well as uh, its watershed and how, you know, through the centuries, we've been so reliant on that water source, not just for, you know, everyday cleaning and hygiene, but for agriculture. You know, our livestock needs water. Um, the fields and the pastures, they need water to grow so the livestock can eat. Um, and then, you know, agriculturally growing squash and pumpkins, all these, these vegetables, fruits and vegetables uh, that we traditionally grow, we're not getting the water that we need for it. And so, you know, today what that has done is uh, it's turned us into a food desert and it's extremely hard to get fresh fruits and vegetables from our supermarkets. And when they do have them, sometimes they're prohibitively expensive. And so with that, you know, kids and parents, they're taking them to McDonald's or taking them down to the convenience store to pick up Cheetos and, you know, microwave bur burrito or something. So that's affecting the overall health and welfare of our population because we're not getting this water that we should have inherited. Instead, it's going to Phoenix and Tucson and Las Vegas, and Southern California to go water golf courses and people can have fountains in their front yard. Um, so that's probably one of the biggest, biggest external um, factor that has negatively affected our health, our communities, um, as well as our politics. As far as you know, corporations outside of that, um, we have had some tussles here and there one of them being with fossil fuels. And it's, it's been a double-edged sword. So the Navajo Nation was a huge, huge um, production area for coal. And it provided a lot of jobs, high paying professional jobs for a lot of people uh, around the Navajo Nation. But now these coal companies are shutting down or they're making huge cutbacks. Um, Power plants are shutting down again, you know, a huge, huge supplier of, of jobs to some place that isn't known for a great job market. I mean, yeah, you can go work at McDonald's or the convenience store, but if you come out of college with a degree, most people don't come back because there's not that job market that's looking to pay an educated engineer or you know, a psychiatrist or a doctor or, or whatnot. Um, so those coal companies, when they were here, they provided great wealth for the Navajo people. But now that they're shutting down and things are going renewable, those jobs are disappearing. Those high paying quality jobs where people can have a career, you know, um, are now disappearing and it's throwing us into an economic downfall. Um, again, you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword because we're taking proactive measures to limit our carbon footprint and, you know, our greenhouse gas, gas outputs um, and making way for renewable energy, but it's making our economy suffer. And our workforce is, uh, you know, has been hit by COVID as well. So it's it's really, really taken a, its toll. Um, and I would say another thing is probably the, the liquor industry, alcohol industry. So the Navajo Nation is, is technically a dry area within our borders. 
you can't possess alcohol, you can't be inebriated, any of that stuff. But of course, they're making it onto the reservation anyways. And back in the 70s, the 60s, 70s, and even into the late 80s, um, Gallup, which is just a 20 minute drive from Winderock here, is a border town. And same thing with Farmington. But Gallup was known as having the most bars and liquor stores per capita in the entire country. Oh, wow. And so, you know, they would bootleg a lot of that alcohol in and then you know, now our police force, and they still do that, and now our police force, um, as small as it is, is spending a huge amount of time rounding up the inebriated, um, you know, making sure they're, they're not a harm to anybody or to themselves. And it's so bad that, you know, domestic violence calls kind of go by the wayside. Um, you know, physical assaults kind of go by the wayside because they just don't have the manpower and they're too busy dealing with um, this effect of the alcohol industry on the Navajo Nation and how it's affecting our people. Um, of course, you know, it, some communities try to hide it for the sake of tourism, but, you know, if you go far enough or you spend enough time here, you're going to see it all over. Um, and, you know, I can't blame one corporation for that, but it's the industry as a whole. Interesting. Um, let's see here. So those are probably the biggest ones right now. Um, that I can put my finger on specifically. And of course, you know, there's small ones here and there, but for the most part, it's, it's those three areas, those and then breaking up again um, hello breaking up again oh yeah i don't hear or see you and of course you know there's not a lot of out oh you're breaking up again You're breaking up. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Oh, it happened again. <laughs> this is a Zoom meeting in case anybody's wondering. But I think it might just be the IT on his side. I just have three more questions. See if he comes back on. There you go. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> okay. Awesome. I, I don't know what happened there. Yeah, I know um, you said that those are the three main reasons, you know, that are affecting your culture. Yeah. And then I wouldn't say it's a outside factor in the sense that, you know, it's being brought upon us. It's rather the dismissal of some of these problems. And of course, you know, it's easy to always blame DC and the politicians, but we are not getting the recognition and help of our troubles. And, and this goes with a lot of the um, Native American tribes out there. You know, we're not getting the help through healthcare, um, again, jobs, you know. Uh, I mean, we could have a huge, uh, tech industry here because you don't really need a whole lot of water. You just need people who know IT. Um, you know, things like that. People aren't seeking out to come here uh, for whatever reason. And, and, and that hurts as well. You know, it hurts on the, the job market side. Uh, you know, some of these grocery stores, they're not doing all that they can to provide better nutritious food. Um, from where they're standing. Now, I know it's not their obligation, but consideration and, and awareness to help and to, you know, um, be there for your constituents, your clients, your employees, your customers. Um, it's, it's not being taken serious right now. So it, it, that hurts us as well. 
just as much as people coming in and you know putting their hands in, in our cookie jar, it's people not being proactive as well. So it's kind of coming in from both sides. And did you ever consider wind turbines? Um, we don't have the land space and Navajo people are very protective of their land. And, you know, there's a lot of pushback coming from the ranchers. They don't want wind turbines and they don't want solar farms because it's their land, you know, their livestock needed. Um, and so that's, that's a big, big obstacle that we ourselves have to work with each other uh, as Navajos to kind of get over that. Um, but we do have a, a, a wind farm up in Northeastern Navajo. Um, we have a couple solar farms. Uh, we have, uh, the biggest one is out by Monument Valley um, in the north uh, on the border of Utah. So there are places there and we have the electrical infrastructure to, to do that, um, but also working with some of these companies that lease those power lines, you know, we have to work with them. That way we can tie them into our uh, renewable electrical grid and spread it all over across the Navajo Nation. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it's something that we're, we're jumping on board with. Yeah, I, I just felt like that's something that you'd be interested in just for the you know, natural nature of it. Yeah. Um, and then inquiry was the last category. Um, what do you want the world to know? Uh, that we still exist. Uh, I, I, it sounds cliche and cheesy, but you know, I do a lot of traveling professionally and personally. And you know, there's still people out there that, oh, you're Indian? I thought they all died, you know? And oh my gosh. It's just it's raising, raising the awareness that, yes, we still exist as Native people. And after that, after we finally get that recognition, then it's, okay, now we need you to bring it into public schools, okay? Because American history is nothing without Native American history. Um, so many keystones of, of our country has come from native culture. Uh, I mean, the, the big one that I always point out is um, our constitutional democracy and how that came about was through the Iroquois League. You know, our founding fathers saw that that type of government worked and so they adopted it. And now with the greatest country in the world with the greatest nation. Um, but, you know, things like that are not taught in the average United States classroom. It's not even spoken about. Uh, I had a history teacher come in last week and he's starting to teach um, US American history in the eighth grade. And he made the proactive decision to come out and visit different tribes and speak to them, you know? That way he can take them back to his class and actually add more than just, you know, a 10 page chapter in American history about native people he will be able to speak more about it. Um, and then of course, you know, I want people to understand that we still live in a modern world. You know, we drive pickup trucks, we stream from Amazon Prime, we order stuff from Amazon. You know, we like our sports. We, like most people can't live without a cell phone. You know, the internet and Wi-Fi is like, now an ingrained part of, of who we are, but we also still live with traditional beliefs that were that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation, and that we are striving to maintain that culture uh, and kind of kind of keep it separate, but have it still recognized that this is still part of America. Like Navajo culture and beliefs is still part of what it means to us to be American. Um, and to live in the United States. And, uh, you know, again, that recognition is not out there. Um, I know there's, I've met people over the past couple of years, and even now that I'm starting to travel uh, with COVID letting up, um, 
some people still think we live in teepees and that we all live in teepees. And, yeah, <laughs> that, you know, different tribes didn't have different ways of dressing or different living structures. You know, we all still wear moccasins and loincloths um, when obviously that's not the case. Uh, so, you know, uh, dispelling some, dispelling just misunderstanding, getting rid of that misunderstanding. Um, and, you know, I, I know the, the African-American community, they're very boisterous, but Navajo people, we kind of, Native people, we kind of want to be left alone. We don't want too much interference, but we still want to be recognized. Like, yes, this is a huge population. Um, one other thing, and, and coming from a museum professional and enjoying museums ever since I was a child, and, you know, when I travel, I like to go see different museums. One of the biggest things is, you know, we're not represented as we should be. One of them was I was down in New Orleans and they have the World War II Museum down there. And, you know, it, it went into the, all these different aspects of World War II. And there was an intro movie that my nephew and I saw. And at the end of it, you know, it was like this whole thing about diversity and how many um, different ethnicities served in the, the military services and you know what huge roles they played throughout history yet natives would never spoken of we were not represented there was literally one panel and it was the size of like a regular um, eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and it had three sentences on it that was the only representation of any native group and what they did in World War II. But what really burns me is it's convenient for them to do that. And it's convenient for them not to recognize that Native Americans serve at a higher rate per capita than any other ethnic group in the United States. We have more servicemen and women in the military at any given time than any other ethnic group. And this has held true since the late 1800s. Um, you know, World War I, the American Revolution even, and all the way through, Native people have served with pride, with dignity, and without bitterness to a country that essentially was trying to genocide the Native people. So, you know, that's, that's something that I really want to have recognized is and it all falls under that umbrella of, yes, we are still here, we still exist. And what is your message to humanity? I was gonna be funny and quote Bill and Ted's movie, everybody be excellent to each other. <laughs> um, but no, I think, I think finding, finding a balance within yourself finding a balance within your community um, and try to maintain that balance as much as you can. Because, you know, and on this big blue ball floating out in the vacuum of space, we have to be mindful of the balance that we hold. And, you know, we can't go too far one way or to the other. And it, it you know, it could be spiritual balance, physical health, um, I mean, even if you look at politics, you know, you can't go too far to one side or you, things get messy. Mm -hmm. So just be balanced, be balanced within yourself, with, with your environment, with the people you interact with, with your community, your family, um, just, just sharing that harmony. And then um, we didn't really touch upon dance, but I feel like because dance was kind of like music, it's probably only used for ceremony as opposed yeah. to- um, yeah. But is there anything that we did not talk about that you would like to mention? Uh, no, I think this was pretty comprehensive. <laughs> uh, Do you want to give us information for your museum? I'm sorry? Would you like to give us the information for your museum? Oh, yeah. So the Navajo Nation Museum it can be found in Winter Rock, Arizona. Uh, we have free admission. We have a Facebook, which is Navajo Nation Museum. And, you know, all of our new exhibits and galleries are posted there. Our community events, uh, little 
arts markets, things that we have throughout the year uh, can all be found on our, our Facebook page as well as our phone number, 928-871-7941. Um, and we are a very small staff and a very large museum. So we try to help everybody equally and as much as we can. And we're here to educate, to preserve our history, our culture, and to propagate our language. Um, and for the most part, you know, we'll share with you as much information as we can. And it, it doesn't matter if you're native, non-native, if you're American, or you know, you're from Germany or Austria, you know, those things don't matter to us. We're here to help the community. Uh, we want to be a focal point for our community. And, you know, not just our small little Winter Rock town, but, you know, the com community of humanity in general. Um, you can also reach out to us at info at NavajoNationMuseum.org if you have any questions. Um, I'm able to do Zoom and Skype. You're also able to come in for a tour. Just go ahead and schedule ahead of time. Um, oh, and you can just go ahead and find us on Google if you want a little bit more information. Um, we're also on TripAdvisor. And, you know, it's a really fun place to come and see. And we encourage if you are ever, ever in the area, you know, stop by. There's no admission. Um, you know, come and say hi and see some smiling faces of some actual Native Americans. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn the recording off, but I, I do want to ask you two questions after this. Yes. Let me just turn this off.